This episode of Positively Trek is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Jim Stoffel, Joyce Marin, Carl Morris, and our associate producer, William Smith. Visit patreon.com slash positively trek to help support the podcast. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you all very much for your support and enjoy the show. This is Positively Track, episode 101, and because we've reached episode 101, I thought it almost sounds like a college course, like a beginner's college course, Positively Track 101. So we're going to break it all down and teach you guys all about Star Trek and how to be positive on today's show. That's what this college course is all about. No, (laughs) actually it's not. We've got a lot to cover here on Positively Trek. I'm Bruce Gibson, and Dan... Gunther is here, and Dan, are you excited to talk about all the stuff we got from First Contact Day? Oh, I am so excited. I was really sad that I wasn't able to uh, watch it live at the time. I was on the road and, and taking care of some family stuff, but so excited. I was really looking forward to getting the chance to talk about it today because I knew this day was coming, that we would sit down and really analyze all of this stuff and, and, and pick it apart and do all the really cool nerdy stuff that we do here. I was very surprised that I actually got to watch it live. I did not think that was going to happen, but it just so happened that my last meeting of the day was right before the first panel. And I was like, well, I'm going to get interrupted. You know, the phone's going to ring, something's going to happen. I won't be, but I'll just watch what I can watch. And I actually got through all of it. Oh, man. <laughs> I actually had, I missed one little piece of a panel because I really had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> that was the only time I missed something. But even the episodes that they showed before and after the panels, I had playing in the background while I was in mm, meetings and that's doing work. Cool. So, uh, yeah, it worked out really well. But we'll dig really deep into that here shortly. We've got, Again, so much to cover, including one of our favorite subjects that we're going to discuss later in the episode, and that is new movie news, possibly? Rumor? What? (laughs) (laughs) Here we go again. Although I do have to say that news looks a little more promising this time around, so... I'm looking forward to talking about that. I think that. so. I, I, I have my thoughts right now, but I'm saving them. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to that at the end. But I'm really excited, really excited to announce that, and you may have already know this, people, but yes, Star Trek Discovery did win at the GLAAD Awards. We talked about this a few episodes back about their nomination. We're like, this has to happen. This has to happen. They won Outstanding Drama Series. And I was like so thrilled when I saw this. I was like, woohoo, yeah, screaming around the house. Yeah, so excellent. They've been nominated for all three seasons. Uh, this is their third nomination and their first win for best for outstanding drama series at the GLAAD Awards. So very well deserved, I think. I know they were up against some stiff competition, but uh, they really did, I think, represent that community very well this season. I think that it's great that they're being recognized for it. Yeah, and you can go online, there's a video, and we'll have the link in the show notes, but four of the actors from Discovery were there to accept the award and made some comments. So we had Wilson Cruz there, who plays Hugh Colbert. We had Anthony Rapp there, who plays Paul Stamets. We had Blue Del Barrio, who was there, who plays Adira Tall. And then we have Ian Alexander, who plays Gray Tall. And I have to say that my youngest daughter does not watch Discovery. I can't really get her into Star Trek. But when I told her this, she got all excited. And I was like, see, I told you Star Trek was cool. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, I think this that's a really good point. This might be something that helps fans who haven't really been into Star Trek maybe sit up and take notice and realize what they're doing here. So uh, that's really cool. I didn't think of that aspect of it. Yeah. And I mean, they had some stiff competition. I think there was, what, roughly 10 nominees or something in this category, eight or 10 of them. And I mean, there was a lot that they were up against. But, you know, I just had the feeling in my gut when we were talking about this, that Discovery had a really good chance of winning. So I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. So that's great news. But then we also want to touch on some sad news here on the show. So Star Trek author Margaret Wander Bonanno passed away this past week. And she was 71 years old. She has written many Star Trek novels, many big Star Trek novels that we have read. And we even had her recently on the show 
back in August of 2020, talking about the, her classic book, Strangers from the Sky. That's episode number 25, if you want to go back and listen to that. And yeah, this is tweeted out originally from Mike Akuda, and I was shocked by this. Uh, of course, I wasn't expecting it, and it was sad news to hear, and uh, it kind of made me feel down for a while. Absolutely, yeah. A, a great, amazing voice in uh, Star Trek literature over the past however many decades, and a huge loss for sure. And you know, we, like you said, had the the huge honor and privilege of speaking with her about Strangers from the Sky a few months ago. And I know at the time that we had her on, we had talked about having her on again to talk about uh, her novel, uh, The Music of the Spheres, her first draft of Probe, of the novel that eventually became Probe. And there's a whole story behind that, which, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into at some point. But yeah, it, it's really a huge loss. She was an amazingly fun person to talk to and with a really unique perspective on those early years of Star Trek and uh, definitely a, a keenly felt loss here. Yeah, I really felt privileged to have the opportunity to talk to her. I've never talked to her before. And not only did we get to spend the time on the show to talk to her, but when we record with authors, we talk before the show and then we talk probably even more after the show, just about things in general, Star Trek or anything in life or anything in the news, whatever it is. And we had that opportunity. And I've read almost everything that she's written Star Trek wise. I think I'm just missing out on It's Our Come Round, which is uh, the six books in the Mirror Anarchy series. Uh, but I've read it everything else. And I mean, she started with Dwellers in the Crucible in 1985 and Unspoken Truth in 2010. So there's a good chunk of time of 25 years of her writing and publishing Star Trek novels. Mm -hmm, definitely, for sure. And, uh, you know, one of her uh, more recent novels, more recent, I say 2003, I guess, I guess that's 17, 18 years ago now, e. um, but Catalyst of Sorrows in the Lost Era series, we're slowly making our way through the Lost Era. So that is one that I'm assuming we will get to at some point as well. So yeah, her voice is heard in, in many corners of Star Trek literature and, and, and she's definitely uh, been a presence throughout. And I love it when I see those old, older authors' names come up on newer books that they're still writing and still doing that. And uh, it's, it's sad that we won't hear from her in the Star Trek universe again now. Well, let's go into some other things since we're talking about books. We do have a new issue of Star Trek Year 5 that was released this week. It's issue number 20. And I read it. It's really good. It revolves around Spock. And let's just say without giving much away, but Spock learns about some things in Vulcan history that may have not always been accurate. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So check it out. Get uh, Star Trek year five, number 20. Yeah. Read it because I mean, we ha it's, it's written by writer Brandon Easton and artist is Sylvia Califano. So check it out. And we're going to review it in a future episode of book club. We're going to soon in May go through issues 13 through 19 because that's how they're being published in the trade paperback. And so I've already read them all. I already have my thoughts. So I'm saving them for May. And then we'll hit issue 20 and the others sometime later in the year. Excellent. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm holding off on reading them all. I kind of want to read them a little bit more uh, closer to that date and get a fresh perspective. So uh, yeah, I haven't read any of these yet. I'm really excited because I've been hearing really good things about them. Yeah, and we have our book club coming up on the next episode, episode number 102, and we're going to review the novel Survivors, which is the early TNG novel number four that came out back in 1989. And Dan, I think that this is my first time reading it. I think it is for you too, right? Yeah, it's one uh, I've had on my shelf again, picked up at a used bookstore. One day I was like, oh, I don't have that one and grabbed it. And it sat on my shelf for probably a decade. Uh, and this is the first time I've read it as well. So uh, I'm about three quarters of the way through and, and it's it's interesting. 
I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you like Tasha Yar, this is a really good book. You have to read it uh, because it really focuses on her character. And yeah, I'm about three quarters of the way through myself. So maybe we can read the rest together. We take turns reading to each other. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, that's coming up on our next episode of Positively Track, but let's get into First Contact Day. Oh my gosh. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, I only expected to maybe get some little brief news about Prodigy and that was it. I didn't expect to see and get as much information as we did throughout the whole day. I, I really have to admit that was shocking to me. There were definitely some pr- some surprises. I think for me, the biggest surprise was, well, actually... I'd say the Picard and the uh, Discovery trailers, I was absolutely shocked at those. Uh, the fact that that there's actually something presented and, and filmed and shown to us from Picard. Now, again, not anything from the show, I don't think. This is all just promo stuff, but that was incredible. And Discovery, I had no, I had no idea they had enough stuff ready to go for a trailer. That blew my mind. Oh, I know. I didn't expect that either. I remember one of the things we discussed the week before was that they were going, that Patrick Stewart was going to make an announcement on something. And mm-hmm. we joked, oh, gee, I wonder what that is. Oh, that Picard's in production now? Yeah. And sure enough, they were like, well, Patrick Stewart has an announcement for us. He's like, yes, I'm proud to say we've started production on Picard. And I started yelling at my monitor and saying no really no (laughs) i was like but little did you know little did i know yes right (laughs) so then oh we have a brief little teaser trailer oh okay and i'm thinking we're not gonna see much of anything i don't know what they're gonna show and so dan i have to ask as you're watching this when we got to the end of that what was your reaction to it I okay so first of all we get the the zoom in on the card and it's the the queen of hearts and I'm like okay I'm remembering the first episode of season 1 that poker game between data and picard in the dream and data plays five queens of hearts and I'm like oh yes. that is more significant than I thought okay and then the card starts disappearing like avengers end game style or <laughs> avengers infinity war style whatever with the snap <laughs> like it's a thanos snap this card's getting snapped away i don't know what's <laughs> right. going on here and as as it gets towards the corner i'm like oh my god and it stops and it's q and you hear his voice and and that was amazing i was blown away that was incredible <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing how you went through that whole process of what you were thinking, because those were the exact same thoughts I had. I thought about that opening scene in the first episode of Picard with the Queen of Hearts. and mm. But this was a single card sitting there. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Is that just a coincidence or does it tie back to that? I think it ties back to that. And like you said, the Thanos dissolved. Thing. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> wait, am I in the Marvel Universe right now? What's happening here? But, you know, I wasn't. It was so funny because I wasn't like, oh, yay. I was just like, nice. I just mm-hmm. remember being really calm, like, nice. That's cool. Like, I guess because I wasn't necessarily expecting it, but it didn't surprise me either. Like, it would not surprise me to see Q pop up in Star Trek Picard at one point, especially on a past episode of this podcast. We talked about how John Delancey sent a cryptic message to a fan of you know, keep your eyes open. I may be appearing sometime again soon or something to that effect. Yeah. That was a nice little bit of a teaser. And I remember like at the time we were like, is he talking about the fact that he's already appeared on lower decks? Is he just going to pop in for another five second thing on lower decks sometime in the future? But no, it looks much more significant that he's going to play a role in this season two of Picard, which by the way, like the rest of the trailer or the teaser we should talk a little bit about too, the frequent mentions of time and the discussion in the panel about some particular moment in Picard's life or something like that. So I don't know. What do you think this season's going to be about? I, I I feel like there's time travel or second chances or kind of something like that is going to come into play, but I don't know. 
I really have no clue. I have no idea. And when I think about it even more, it I have no clue because <laughs> I like how does this revolve around the other characters, right? Mm-hmm. Because the story in the first season was all about Soji and you know the the crew that's being put together and the Borg and the Romulans and all that. How does that fit into this, right? And so mm. If there is some kind of time element, and this is Picard's journey, I'm just curious how the characters on his ship fit into this, even Seven of Nine, you know? Yeah. I don't know. And where's Guinan, right? I was just going to say, we also know that Guinan's going to be in the season. So I'm, I'm, how does she fit in? Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> it could be just a one episode thing, you know? Yeah. Where it's I mean, just Q and Guinan. Riker and Troy were just a real one episode thing, except for Riker showing up again at the end. So yeah, it could be something like that. I want to see Guinan and Q together though, whatever this episode is, I hope they're together because what is going on between those two from season two of TNG? We still don't know. And I wonder if we'll learn more about Guinan's character, you know, more of her past. Cause she's still somewhat mysterious. Mm-hmm, absolutely. The true final frontier is time. Time can turn even our most impulsive, our most ill-considered actions into history. What we do in a crisis often weighs upon us less heavily than what we wish we had done. What could have been. offers so many opportunities, but never second chances. The trial never ends. And then John Delancey, the actor who plays Q, has said, like, you know, he's a little worried because it's been 20 years. He's, you know, he's supposed to be immortal and yet he's aged in real life. You know, it's like, how are they going to pull that off? And I thought, well, they did it with Brent Spiner, right? As Data, they could do something with John. Yeah, I'm not too worried about that. I feel like Q can appear however he wants to appear. And he's like, oh, Jean-Luc, I didn't want to make you feel self-conscious. So I've appeared like this or something, whatever, you know. (laughs) Jean-Luc, you're looking much older. So I decided to look older, too. (laughs) (laughs) Because he's done that before as well in All Good Things. Remember, he showed up all old with the long hair and the... That's true. Yeah, yeah, he has a a habit of, of... mocking the age of Picard, I guess. Oh my gosh. What if he shows up like he did in that last episode TNG? (laughs) That would be terrific. (laughs) Or maybe he just shows up as his lower deck self. Voila. Hey Picard, I am animated. (laughs) You've always been animated to me. (laughs) But yeah, that's exciting. So I'm really looking forward to that. We're not going to see that until next year though. So let's no, not that get would be 2022 for Picard. So. Yeah. So we got a ways away to wait, but that's okay. You know, cause we got other stuff coming. That's cool. I love that. We have other stuff coming. There's never a dry moment in Star Trek anymore. <laughs> so oh, before I go through all these, Dan, because you mentioned earlier that you didn't get to watch them live. Have you been able to watch them all at this point? I was I was gonna I I wasn't gonna reveal my hand, but no, I have not watched all of them. Well, it's a lot to watch. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping that in the course of this podcast, thanks for outing me, by the way, oh, uh, that I sound like I've watched these, but no, I've not watched them all. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, you're not missing a whole lot. I mean, we're touching on all the things that you probably have already heard, you know. But there was a First Contact 25th anniversary panel. And of course, we just reviewed that movie in our last episode. And it was just great to kind of hear Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Frakes, Brent Spiner, and Alex Krieg talk about their experience on the set. Um, And it was nice to hear Alice talking about Jonathan Frakes as a director. Hmm, That's cool. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was just little nice moments like that. And 
thinking back to the past. So yeah, check it out. Nothing big, huge revealing that I remember from it. It was just a nice little reunion of them kind of reminiscing about working on the movie together. And then after that panel, we had creating first contacts panel. And I'm sorry, I'm laughing because, you know, this is when they're talking about the costumes and the special effects on the different series and such. And this is the point I had to leave for a while to use the restroom. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just fun to hear, you know, all the work and the attention and detail they put into things. And uh, Gersha Phillips, who works on the costumes, the costume designer, uh, there's a, I don't think it was part of the panel, but there is a uh, clip or a, a short video about her talking about the new costumes. I think actually it was part of the panel. But anyway, I've seen it on YouTube. And again, I showed my youngest daughter last night that clip. And my daughter wants to be a fashion designer. So she was all into it. I mean, she's oh, just very like, cool. oh, I love the seams. Oh, I just want to touch that fabric. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually kind of funny. And this is just a bit of a side note. I, I have started looking into the, the Star Trek Discovery trading cards. And one of the things uh, that's in uh, you get every so often in a pack is a relic card, which has a little tiny piece of fabric from a costume from an episode or, or from a particular character. And some of them, yeah, you get like the, the seam or something, something interesting rather than just like the plain panel and, uh, probably not really supposed to do this to like protect your stuff, but I'm always like rubbing the fabric like, Oh, that's, that's really cool. Like the fabric they use and this, the seams they sew and stuff. I'm like, ah, that's neat. And the little, uh, gold Delta patterns. Sometimes you get a little piece with that in it and it's just gorgeous. So. But you don't know who's worn that costume, where that fabric came from, do you? Yeah, it says on the back, it's a piece of um, like Lorca's costume or something f from Discovery Season 1 or uh, Pike's costume in Season 2 or whatever, yeah. Okay, well that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're right there on the set touching their costume while they're in it. <laughs> you can just imagine that. And Lorca's like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, just as a little... Ah, uh, look, he's showing it to me. Oh, I'm, I like it. Nice. And then, yeah, it says on the back. Okay, cool. So you have a <laughs> piece of costume of Michael Burnham's too. Wow. Yeah, this one's from uh, like the spacesuit or or the thing she wears under the spacesuit, I think. Wow, Sonequa Martin-Green yeah. wore that, Dan. <laughs> and now it's on your shelf. It's there, a piece yep. of her. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get into costumes more, so- Hold off on that, because the next panel was Women in Motion. And this is that documentary about uh, Nichelle Nichols that uh, about her in the space program and helping to get awareness out and get people of color, of women and all kinds of diversity into NASA. And this is a documentary that I keep ex wanting to purchase or rent and I keep forgetting to do it. And now it's going to be on Paramount Plus starting on June 3rd. So I'm very happy that this is coming out. That's very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Is it going to be on Paramount Plus in other regions as well outside of the U.S.? That would be I don't actually have Paramount Plus still, though. So I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I was wondering that, too. Um, they didn't say that on the panel. Uh, the documentary is called Woman in Motion, and it was on the Women in Motion panel. But that was actually a really good panel. Uh, I really enjoyed that because we had Sonequa Martin-Green on there, and we had Picard's Michelle Hurd, Issa Briones, and we have Don Lewis from Lower Decks. And they were talking about being women of color on these series and working in Hollywood and the messages that they're getting across from being on Star Trek and how uplifting it is and how it's getting awareness out uh, that they can be prominent people and look at the impact we're having on the younger generation. And they're talking about, you know, young girls saying, you know, I can see myself. And they're talking about seeing Nichelle playing Yahura and like what it meant to them. And so that was a really interesting panel. I really enjoyed that one. You should check that one out. That's really cool. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's, easy to underestimate the uh, impact that seeing more representation of 
traditionally underrepresented roles in Star Trek is. And I'm, I'm glad they talked about that. That's really cool. Uh, I mean, us, us white guys, we've had heroes on TV for ages and we will for ages to come, you know? So it's so great to see, you know, young women, uh, seeing themselves, like you said, in, in these, uh, in their heroes on television. And, uh, yeah, speaking of, uh, of people of color and, and, these actresses, uh, just as a little side note here, I've been listening once again to the pod directive, the, uh, the official Star Trek podcast hosted by Tawny Newsom, and, yes. uh, she's incredible. I, I, I don't want to pimp too many other podcasts, but listeners go listen to that. If you haven't been, it's, it's so much fun. Yeah. I saw <laughs> that they've premiered their season two of that podcast just recently. So I haven't listened to all of them yet. I just listened to the little introduction. Hey, we're back, you know, and I'm really looking forward to listening to that. But yeah, this was a really great panel. Check it out. Uh, yeah. It's important for you to see yourself on the screen. You know, they talk about that. So yeah, mm. really good. Really good. I, I almost feel like watching it again now, but that wasn't it. Oh no, there had to be more. So then we have a trailer for Star Trek Discovery Season 4, a teaser trailer, and check it out. We're all living in uncertainty, even for a crew as familiar with it as this one. The stress is taking its toll, but we are not in this alone. None of us are. Five light years across. That's the size of the gravitational anomaly. Where's it headed next? It could go anywhere. And we may not have any kind of warning at all. Federation, non-Federation. This anomaly threatens us equally. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out together. Indeed, we are more than allies. Captain Burnham. Make no mistake, you are in charge. She has faith in me. We are facing something we don't understand. Something that could tear us all apart. But there's only one way to confront the unknown. Together. Okay, thoughts, Dan, on this trailer. I first of all, as I said at the beginning, just its mere existence, <laughs> I, I was totally blown away by that. But there's so many nice little surprises in here. The new uniforms, for one thing, like we called it that they wouldn't be sticking with those gray uniforms. They are gorgeous. I love those bright colors and the fact that it's using the TNG coloring style. So red for command, yellow for security and ops and, and blue for sciences and medical or actually medical is white still, which I like yeah. that as well. Yeah. But Burnham looks gorgeous in that red uniform and, uh, oh man, I, I, that was my one thing. The first time I watched it through, I just couldn't take my eyes off. I would, I wasn't even paying attention to what was happening. I was just like looking at the uniform details and stuff. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it until you just start talking. I was picturing Burnham in that uniform and it has like a combination to me of TOS, the motion picture, and then the movies that follow from the wrath of Khan on, because you've got that red kind of maroon color. It's more of a red than a maroon but it kind of reminds me of the movie era uniforms. But then on the shoulders, it has those, I don't know what you call them, but little things on your shoulders that remind me of what was on the shoulders of the movie, of the motion picture uniforms. Mm, yeah, the the epaulets, I think they call them or something okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. and then, uh, then the idea that everybody has a different color tunic representing their departments reminds me of TOS. So it's like a combination of those three into one. Yeah. But yeah, I like that they kept with the style that we saw at the end of season three, but changed up the colors to make it work better on that bridge. Yeah. And, and I had read that that was the thinking behind it was the the gray uniforms, kind of like we said, they just blended too much into the background. And these ones really make them pop and look great on that set. So 
Uh, yeah. Um, the other thing is we, we see the Federation president finally. Yeah. And that was exciting. She's, uh, seems to be half Cardassian, half something else. Something. Maybe human, maybe Bajoran, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe three things. I, I, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my I my first thought when I saw her was Denobulan, actually, but the, oh. the ridges are a little different. So, but yeah, the, so we know that season four is coming out in late 2021. So we are getting it later this year. Yeah. I love the new uniforms and we have a synopsis for season four. And I know how much you like reading these, Dan. So I'll turn it <laughs> over to you. Season four of Star Trek Discovery finds Captain Burnham and the crew of the USS Discovery facing a threat unlike any they've ever encountered. With Federation and non-Federation worlds alike feeling the impact, they must confront the unknown and work together to ensure a hopeful future for all. There's always a threat, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you need a threat. You need something to, to propel the narrative. But uh, yeah, so th from the trailer, it's this gravitational anomaly or something like that. I'm not certain exactly what the, the it's kind of vague as to exactly what the issue is. Yeah, and I've heard some complaints online where people are like, oh, yet another th galaxy threat or something, but they never say it's a threat to the whole galaxy. You know, yeah. It could be just no. a certain region, you know, it could mm -hmm. be a small region, but then also it could not even be the whole season. It could be something that just that's how the season starts off, but that's not the main plot of the whole arc, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Because that's why this is a teaser. They're just teasing us. It's not the mm -hmm. details. Uh, one thing that I, I did want to make note of, they do say debuting in late 2021, one piece of news that came out about a week ago, week and a half ago, was that the filming on Discovery was going to go later than they had originally planned. And they're planning on wrapping up filming in September now, which led some people to, to speculate, oh, maybe they won't be able to debut in 2021. After all, it'll be pushed a little later. But it looks like with this, they're still sticking to that debuting in 2021, probably not having the whole season in 2021, but they are going to debut in late 2021 still uh, as of them putting together this first contact day material. So that's good news, I think. Yeah. I mean, they can still be in production while a season is coming out. They just have mm -hmm. to catch up and get it all edited together before it's supposed to premiere for those later episodes. So yeah, that's an interesting concern, uh, if, but we'll see. Yeah, if they're still saying late 2021, then they must feel like they can make that date. Mm -hmm. So, coming out also in 2021 is the second season of Star Trek Lower Decks. I'm telling you, this is so exciting. And I love that the panel's called Second Contact, because that was also the first episode's title of the series. And... Just to talk about this new season coming, and we got a date of August 12th, and we got a teaser trailer. I didn't expect that either. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect that. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Check it out. Here it is. What up? We doing sci-fi stuff today? Missing is Boimler. He's got to be having the time of his life. Ah! Alert! I'm starting to think this jam session's got too many licks and not enough comps. What does that even mean? And look at that. We have Jonathan Frakes back as Captain Riker. Of course. I mean, we wondered. We figured we might, but it's so great to see that he's back too. Well, they had said right at the end of season one that he would be back in season two, that Boimler would still be on the Titan and we'd still have Riker. So not a surprise, but still great to get him in the trailer for sure. Sometimes I don't remember things like that because I think, is it something that I was just thinking is going to happen or did I hear it's going to happen? <laughs> was that wishful thinking or did they actually say that? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> but we also got an official announcement that Paramount Plus has renewed Lower Decks for a third season. 10 episodes Woo oh i'm so excited that's so cool <laughs> uh yeah I'm, I'm really um surprised i guess not surprised it was kind of a toss-up but it's uh it's it's a fun surprise that season two of lower decks is the next thing we're going to be getting 
So August 12th, it's the only one of these series that has a set start date. So I guess August 12th is the next Star Trek we'll be getting and it's Lower Decks. I honestly did think it would be Prodigy. I thought they were a little further along with Prodigy than they were Lower Decks, but I guess not, maybe. But uh, still so excited that that's what we're leading off with. Well, let's talk about that because the Prodigy panel followed this one, and I was surprised that we still don't have a date. I mm-hmm. mean, I thought that Prodigy was in production before season two of Lower Decks. And yet, I think it was, yeah. but I, I, I think it's a little more intensive as far as the, the, um, animation the, or yeah, the production and post-production stuff, I think is a little bit more intense for prodigy from what I've heard from some people. Well, I think we're still going to get it this year. They didn't even say that. I don't think they just, said uh, it, they, they, they have, yeah, yeah. They have in the past already said that it would be this year. So my, well, yeah. my guess, my guess is it's. My guess it is it's after Lower Decks before Discovery. That's where I think it's going to be um, premiered. Yeah, I think you're right, too. And Yeah, I knew that they had previously mentioned it. What I meant was they haven't mentioned it on this panel, which is surprising oh. to me. You know? Okay, I haven't watched the panel yet, but... And maybe they did and I don't remember. <laughs> Again, I, I, know all the art, I know all the artwork they've released and are continuing to release says coming in 2021 at the bottom. And okay. I don't think that's changed. Well, maybe they did say it and I just forgot. Okay, so I think it's still on for this year, but I'm still surprised we didn't get a date. But, you know, it's like back in the past, there were certain girls I'd ask out and I'd be surprised that I didn't get a date. But anyway, um, <laughs> we got to see... Catherine Janeway, Captain Catherine Janeway in the flesh, or should I say in the animation? Yeah, pretty cool. Very nice character design, fitting in well with what we've already seen as well. I think she looks gorgeous. I think a really cool character model for uh, for Janeway. <laughs> I keep hearing people online saying her legs are too long. <laughs> I'm like, but that's just the animation <laughs> style of the series, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be the exact dimensions of Kate Mulgrew. Come on. It's an animated character. But I was surprised by this. Okay, so there were two things. One, I predicted that we would get new uniforms and Discovery. Check. Got that right. But then I predicted that Janeway would not be a hologram. And I was wrong on that because she is an emergency training hologram, which surprised me. Because I just thought Kate Mulgrew would be like, I don't want to play Janeway if she's a hologram. I want to actually be the real character. But... Yeah, I mean, she's a hologram. So we we have learned that this takes place about five years after Voyager's return to the Alpha Quadrant. So I saw some speculation online, and I think it's entirely possible she could also play her real self, who at this time is an admiral in Starfleet. Uh, and we know the, the, the show takes place in the Delta Quadrant on a lost Starfleet ship or something like that. And I've seen interesting speculation about that, but we could get some like scenes of, of Janeway in Starfleet command or something. I, I, I wouldn't put it pl- past them, but uh, I wasn't really necessarily hoping for the hologram aspect of the story. But now that that's revealed that that's what it is, I'm curious to see where they take it. Yeah. And I love that they show the character holding a cup of coffee. So, yes <laughs> the hologram does drink coffee too <laughs> it's a very it's a very well programmed hologram because they got that right <laughs> yeah but i do love that the hologram is captain janeway and not admiral janeway so that makes mm-hmm. it feel a little more connected to voyager because it's a hologram that is featuring this character when she served on the voyager but yeah i can see that we might see the admiral i hadn't thought about that that's entirely possible but i think that one character that you said is a Talaxian, I think you're right, since it's in the Delta Quadrant. I think so too. I, I'm 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 more optimistic about that. Not I mean, not optimistic. I wasn't like, oh, I really hope there's a Talaxian in this show. <laughs> but right. you know, I, I think I'm right. I think I'm right about that. <laughs> well, you usually are, Dan. <laughs> ah, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to me, you are. <laughs> So, okay, I'm curious because you said you've seen several theories about this ship. I put one here in the notes from the website, the Trek Collective. I, and if anybody doesn't want to hear any kind of speculation or theories, maybe you want to just jump ahead a couple of minutes. We're not going to go into this much detail, but in the Trek Collective, they say it could be Voyager's missing aero shuttle. 
It's an interesting thought. It could be the reason we never saw it in Voyager's run is that, you know, that they lost it or something and it was covered over with a, with a panel or something. That's the, the aero shuttle. I should say for those who don't know is similar to a captain's yacht on, uh, the enterprise. It's a ship that docks on the underside of the saucer section. I don't know the arrowhead section of the ship, I guess. And, and it's kind of that shape that looks like a little bit like a runabout with wings. That's what the aero shuttle supposedly is. That could very well be. I feel like that might be wishful thinking because we've just wanted to see that ship, but uh, it's an interesting thought. I, I've seen other theories that, you know, the Delta Flyer, which was destroyed the first one in the uh, season six finale, maybe wasn't completely destroyed and they somebody found it and rebuilt it or something. Uh, there's also a few shuttles that have been left here and there around the Delta Quadrant during Voyager's run. Most notably, two intact shuttles were given to some telepathic refugees at the end of the episode Counterpoint, uh, in, and I believe season five. So there's some various Starfleet shuttles floating around the region that this could be. Could it also be a duplicate of Voyager? It's entirely possible. That would be interesting. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> it just seemed a little too much, but it might be a bit confusing too <laughs> to view. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, that that's interesting. I, you know, more I'm thinking about the hologram of Janeway. It's interesting that you know they have the Doctor, who's a hologram, and did they create a training hologram based on his program of? you know, to be Janeway. And does she appear? Please state the nature of the training emergency. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she and the doc hang out together. What? You know, there, there's another one. We'll get to see the doctor. That's entered my mind, especially when you said a, a duplicate of Voyager, because technically the doctor's part of Voyager, right? So. Right. And so he might be on this other ship, even if it's not a duplicate of Voyager. I mean, if yeah. there's a hologram of Janeway, there could be a hologram of the doctor. I that bet. Would be interesting. I bet we will because these cadets could get into some medical problems, right? I mean, someone's got to take care of them. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I it would be really cool, and it wouldn't be that hard to get Bob Picardo just into the sound booth, right? I mean, yeah, you don't have to go through wardrobe and all that stuff. It's just recording the voice. So okay, I'm ready for that announcement. We're calling it here. That's going to happen. <laughs> Robert Picardo is going to be on Prodigy guaranteed guaranteed so i'm calling it right now well that's the highlights of the panels and matt man what a first contact day that was i mean i was oh, not expecting all that i was so sad to have to be i mean i i was happy to be on the road and helping out my family and stuff but just the timing of it i've had a year where i've not been busy <laughs> and then something comes up the week that this happens so uh, it's too bad that I couldn't see it all live, but uh, I've I've watched a bunch of it, and I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of it uh, when I get some time here. Well, what was really cool, because I'm working from home. Now, see, I probably wouldn't have been able to do this pre-COVID or post-COVID whenever if I'm in an office. I, I wouldn't have been able to watch the panels like this. But being at home, as I said, it just so happened I didn't have any meetings during those times. But prior to the panels and after, I did have some work and some meetings I had to do. So I had these episodes they were playing had it going on in the background and I really enjoy just this live streaming of random Star Trek episodes. I love the idea of seeing arena from TOS play. And then right after that comes lower decks and it's the second contact episode, the very first episode. Then after that is deep space nine and a short treks and Voyager. I just love the idea of just these random Star Trek episodes all playing as opposed to like when I go to Paramount plus or Netflix or prime you know, you start an episode and then it goes to the next episode of the series. And now you're, you're in that, let's say Voyager universe of Voyager episode after Voyager episode. I like the mix. I want to see mm -hmm. more of that. Yeah. I like that idea. And, and the fact that this was the best of first contacts, you know, kind of keeping in with that theme. I think that that's a lot of fun. I really enjoy that they did that. Yeah. I'd like to see them do more of that or even just do it even on Paramount plus just have a day where they're just going to stream episodes, random episodes with a certain theme to it. And we all just get on, we're all watching it live. We can all tweet about it. You know, I, yeah. I, I like to see more of that happen. Maybe leading up to Picard season two, they can show like all the Q episodes or all yes. the time travel episodes or something like that. 
Oh, I love that idea. That's perfect. Yeah, that would be a <laughs> lot of fun. So, but also on first contact day, they put out the hashtag Star Trek United Gives, and they say if you tweet out using that hashtag, they will automatically, and I say they meaning Paramount Plus, will automatically donate a dollar to organizations who do real world work for champion equality social justice and the pursuit of scientific advancements and so i did do that they've done this before uh but anytime they have these events they do this hashtag star trek united gives or something similar to it and it's just a great thing to easy to do you don't have to do any money you just tweet it out or post it or instagram it or whatever and they donate money towards these organizations yeah, very cool. And, you know, really living that Star Trek message, you know, not just not just giving us shows and stuff, but really uh, walking the walk when it comes to trying to make the world just a little bit better. I, I love that. That's what we try to do here, too. Just make it a little bit better, Dan. Right. I hope so. I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that big of an audience to really change the world yet. But, you know, tell all your friends to listen and we'll all change the world together to be positive. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and your friends will be like, what is this? What show are you? I'm not into Star Trek. Why would I listen to that? <laughs> anyway, hey, Star Trek First Contact Day. I'm sitting there. This is so funny because I love the logo. And I, I was like, you know what? It'd be cool to have a T-shirt to wear in First Contact Day. And sure enough, they have merchandise. <laughs> Not even just T-shirts, but like a mug and a hoodie and blanket. I don't know. There's several things. Imagine that. Yeah, I mean, we just came from a story where, where we said, oh, yeah, they're trying to make the world a better place and blah, blah, blah. They're also trying to make a bit of money. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's that, that's a thing. But yeah, let's admit that. That's the thing, yeah. <laughs> but then at the same time, I'm like, oh, well, now I want to buy a T-shirt and I'll wear it next year. But then, honestly, I was thinking, well, what if they change the logo next year? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because I want to wear it on First Contact Day and that's it. Just on that day, you know? Well, you'll have to buy that year's T-shirt and wear it the next year then. And then... I have to remember to look in advance, right? Yeah. <laughs> do that. I don't know. Maybe I'll still get it. I don't know. I have to think about that one. So, oh my gosh, Whew, I'm sweating. There's so much going on, Dan. Um, <laughs> this one I'm very excited to talk about. Well, I'm excited about talking about everything. But Star Trek Mission Chicago, a new convention coming April 8th through the 10th in 2022. Yes, ladies oh and gentlemen. my goodness. The big official conventions are back from Star Trek, from the licensed property. Now... They've been officially licensed to creation for the past, I don't know, decade or more or whatever in, well, even longer than that. But in Las Vegas, they've been having it for almost two decades, I think. And creation has been officially licensed to represent Star Trek. And Dan and I have been to a few of those. So I've been to a couple of them. But uh, this year, that didn't happen. They were not officially licensed. So in August... That convention is now called the 55-Year Mission Convention or something like that. So it can't use the word Star Trek. But here it's because Star Trek has licensed now to Read Pop. And Read Pop's going to do it in Chicago. And not only are they going to do it in Chicago next year, but they're going to do a convention apparently every year in a different city, mm -hmm. which I think is cool too. That's very cool. I mean, I love Las Vegas. I've enjoyed going to Vegas, but I've been there a bunch of times now. Uh, this is exciting. The new official Star Trek convention uh, done by Reed Pop, as you said, going to be in Chicago, going to be in different cities after that. I'm excited for that because I've never been to Chicago and there's a bunch of places in the US I've never been to that, you know, it, maybe it'll be in Phoenix one year. I've never been to Phoenix. That's cool. <laughs> I, I I don't know. But uh this is really neat because Reed Pop, of course, they do a bunch of other conventions. They're known for they they do the New York Comic Con, Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo, and of course the Star Wars Celebration event. I've not been to any of those conventions, but you, of course, have been to Star Wars Celebration. I, I, I'm thinking a few times. What can you tell us about how they do conventions and and are you excited by this news? Or are you kind of like, mm, I don't know. I am excited about this news 
Yes, I've been to four Star Wars celebrations. The first one I went to in 2015 in Anaheim, California, then London, England, Orlando, Florida, and then the last one was in Chicago, Illinois at McCormick Place, where this Star Trek convention is going to take place. So I will tell you this. I've gotten to know some of the Repop people. I've been Mm -hmm. on podcast stages at the events. So I don't know if they'll do the same thing there at this convention where there'll be a stage where different podcasts can record in front of an audience and even do it live online if they wanted to. That might be a feature. I've also been part of the official improv group of Star Wars Celebration. (laughs) I don't know if we'll do improv at the Star Trek convention, but we'll see. I sure hope so. (laughs) It'd be great. Aaron Harvey, call me. Let's discuss. And Brandy, you too, of course. Definitely. But, you know, I will in, be in the audience watching. <laughs> oh gosh. No, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but I will tell you this. My first experience with Repop at the first Star Wars celebration I went to, I thought they did a fantastic job in Anaheim. I felt the same way in London. But the convention got really big because the new movies had just come out after that. And then it started to get really crazy in Orlando. I don't think they were expecting the crowds. I heard rumors that volunteers didn't show up like they were supposed to. So in a lot of ways, that one was kind of a train wreck, which really disappointed me because I thought they did a fantastic job at the previous two. So Chicago to me was the real test after Orlando. And I thought they did a very good job. Still probably had some issues, but that's because I think a lot of it has to do with crowd size. I mean, the Star Wars Celebration crowds are getting to be very big. So you don't have as much easy access to get into things because things get filled up like quickly and there's long lines and stuff. I don't expect the crowds to be that big at Star Trek Mission, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Star Trek's not as popular as Star Wars, okay? McCormick Place is a big convention center. I've been to industry conventions there and, of course, Star Wars Celebration. Repop, at least with Star Wars Celebration, maybe they've done other, others at that location. They've got their act together. They know what works and what doesn't work at that facility. I think this will be a very well-run and managed convention, and I think this will be a great first step for Star Trek Mission. Well, I'm really excited. That's that's very, very cool. You said, and and now I feel like I'm suddenly interviewing you about this story. (laughs) You said, uh, you know, some of the people at Reed pop, you've gotten to know them. So, uh, who are we booking on this podcast to talk about this, uh, this convention then? (laughs) Uh, yeah, I think I can help with that. Maybe we'll, we'll have, maybe we will have someone on to talk. I'm excited. That would Um, be really cool. That would be great. (laughs) And I think they'll be probably willing to do that. We'll have to see. Well, I'll definitely write that down as a possibility. I, I, the other thing I want to add, the Star Wars celebration I went to in Chicago was, I think, two years ago. Maybe it was three. Two years ago. 2019. And it was also in April, around the same time. And I remember at the time people complained, Chicago in April? It's still going to be cold. Well, let me tell you this. If you're planning to go to this convention, by the way, I've been to Chicago many, many times. It's one of my favorite cities. Yes, it can be cold. But it can also be warm. I can tell you during Star Wars Celebration, we had a day where it was warm out and people were in short sleeve t-shirts walking around, some in shorts. The next day, we had a couple inches of snow. (laughs) And it was windy and cold and dreary. And that's the thing about April in Chicago. You never know what you're going to get. So plan accordingly. (laughs) But you're inside most of the time anyway. I will tell you that they have like a big (laughs) arena area. That would be like the main stage. And that's across the street from the rest of the convention center. So there will be times you'd have to go outside to get from one place to the other. And of course, you have to go outside to a restaurant to get your deep dish pizzas. You know, you got to do that while you're in Chicago. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. That's exciting. I mean, you know, things are are kind of opening up again and and getting a little bit more normal. We're in the middle of third wave here in, in Alberta, unfortunately. But, you know, by April of next year, I'm pretty sure I'll have a job. <laughs> I'm pretty sure things will be kind of back to normal. I've never been to Chicago. I'm excited to go. And to your point, I'm in Northern Alberta. Uh, a couple of days ago, it was plus 15 Celsius here. So nice, you know, pretty nice weather. Uh, I woke up to an inch of snow this morning. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> same thing. Yeah. That's how Chicago is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to it. Maybe some of the other people who are, are used to heading to Vegas in August, <laughs> This will be a a fair sight different than that, but 
that's okay. <laughs> well, honestly, if you go to Vegas, you may feel warmer in Chicago because a lot of people complain in Vegas that you're inside most of the time and the, the air AC, conditioning is just yeah. running like crazy and people are freezing <laughs> inside. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, and I'm just interested too because uh, the fun thing about Star Wars Celebration is they announce at the end of the show where the next one's going to be. You know, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's it's that okay. Where's it going to be next year? Feeling you know. And I remember went to the one in Anaheim, the first one I went to, and they announced we're going to be next year in London. And all these people around me were like, oh, and I'm Aww. like, I'm going to <laughs> London. <laughs> that's awesome. So, I never thought yeah. of that. Like we could see this convention go to other countries other than the U.S. as well. I never thought of that. But, it could be yeah, in could Canada. Show up in, yeah, could show up in London, could show up in London, England, could show up in London, Ontario. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Grand Prairie could be there too. <laughs> I'm not holding my breath. Maybe Calgary. Uh, How's that? <laughs> Calgary would be cool. Calgary, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. I mean, there's there's lots oh of possibilities. Gosh. Okay, Toronto would be great because that's where Discovery is exactly, done. Exactly. Yeah, and also Strange New Worlds is done in Toronto, so that would be a great one. Uh, yeah, the, the stars would just have to take a cab from from wherever they're shooting <laughs> yes. to show up at the convention. But I would love Montreal. I love Montreal. I haven't been there in a long, long time. I'd love to get back there. Um, That's cool. I've still never been. I'm from Canada and I've never been to Montreal. I changed well, planes there once, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, it can be a good thing and a bad thing because, again, you know, my example of London, I don't think the next Star Trek mission will be in London necessarily, but, you know... There is that problem of, well, I can get to Chicago, but I can't get to wherever next year. That's too far or whatever. You know, people are going to have that issue. But but you still have the Las Vegas conventions, even though they're not officially licensed. They're still mm-hmm. the same. They're still going to be fun. So you absolutely. Know, yeah. You got both going on now. That's pretty that's pretty huge. I'm excited. You know, I, and. And that's not to downplay the Vegas convention. I loved going to it and I probably will go again. But the idea that there's another official alternative that's going to be in different places, that really excites me. I, I'm really, really excited about this. Well, the official one could start to feel too official. I mean, it's a good thing because that's where you're going to get big announcements and maybe some bigger panels. But then I think the Vegas one will start to feel more intimate and more fan run in a sense you know Mm -hmm. so i think they're going to have different feelings to them you know i think the vegas one's going to feel more like a family reunion where the the mission one is the star trek mission is going to feel more of an official announcement and what news are we going to get kind of convention yeah which is I i think there's room for both and that's great you know uh I, there's, I've, I've always been a fan of smaller conventions, smaller fan run conventions. I went to Vulcan in Vulcan, Alberta for the first time a couple of years ago. And, uh, it was so much fun. The, the just intimate family feeling of it. Uh, obviously I don't think a Vegas convention's ever going to feel quite that intimate, but you know, it, it would be a nice alternative to the big official one too. Okay. I didn't think we'd be talking about this convention as much as we are, but I am so <laughs> pumped right now. <laughs> Honestly, and, and it sounds silly with all of the news that we got on First Contact Day, this is the most excited thing I'm, I'm excited about right now, which is weird. I didn't expect that. But, you know, just part of it, I'm going to be honest, is the fact that we've been cooped up for over a year. Yes. Like the idea of going somewhere, like a destination, especially a city I've never been to, to meet up with fellow Star Trek fans. Oh, I'm just like, I'm tingling thinking about it. (laughs) Well, it's just, it's right. It's like the right dates, right? Because I'm still kind of on the fence about going to Vegas this year. Yeah. You know, like our friend and listener, Justin Ozer made a comment like, well, you know, we're still kind of coming out of it. Some people aren't going to be vaccinated. We still have to have some precautions probably in August. And I was like, yeah, see, that's the kind of thing. I'm just like, Maybe it isn't a good idea yet to go this year, even though, but to your point, I'm just so dying to get out there now, you know, been cooped up and what a great way to go out and just celebrate life now and being with a bunch of Star Trek fans. But maybe April next year, it's going to be a lot more safer at that point. We're a lot further away from this. I mean, we're talking a year from now and I love Chicago. (laughs) So, and (laughs) by the way, when I say improv, I did improv shows at Star Wars Celebration, including the one in Chicago, but Chicago is also a mecca for improv theaters. Mm, And so I went to Second City and they did a special Star Wars 
improv show. And there were people from Lucasfilm and fans there for the improv show. So Brandy and Aaron were going out for improv in Chicago, just so you know. That's cool. I will be in the audience. <laughs> yes. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And you know what else I can't wait to see, Dan? I can't wait to see Star Trek on the big screen someday. <laughs> oh, someday, right? Oh, someday. Man. We've had so <laughs> many rumors and starts and false starts and whatever going on. I don't even know what to make of this. So, yes, we have an announcement, an official announcement, or has it been officially announced? Because it came from Deadline. I think it's been officially announced that in the slate of upcoming releases from Paramount, one of the things listed was a new Star Trek movie coming June 9th of 2023. We actually have a date, June 9th, 2023. Dan, what was your reaction as soon as you saw this? Did you roll your eyes like I did at first? <laughs> I wouldn't say I rolled my eyes. Uh, it was I, It was kind of like my eyebrows shot up a little bit, like... Oh, an actual date, you know, because I, I did see the, the the thing and I was like, oh, okay, they're, they're planning this movie. We know that, oh, they've scheduled a date. I'm still not like overwhelmed, excited or anything like that. But the fact that they've chosen a date, a release date, and I know that's not a be all and end all of a film, as we've said many times, still, you know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm happy to see these incremental movements. We've all of the previous announcements of Star Trek films or ideas never even got to this point. So yeah. this is a bit of an advancement of what we've gotten over the past few years. So I'm excited on, on that count, but yeah, I'm, I'm holding back. I'm trying not to get too excited because Paramount, you've broken my heart before <laughs> and I'm guarded now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to put my heart on the line as I have in the past. But I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm with you. It's like, it's great to see a date. This is very encouraging, but I'm not holding my breath. I mean, anything can happen. We're, this is over two years from now. Anything could happen in the next year. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what this movie is going to be about. We don't know if Chris Pine and cast are going to return. We know nothing. What we do know, apparently, is J.J. Abrams will be producing this Star Trek film. That's really all we know. We don't even know if it's going to use the script ideas that Kalinda Vasquez was putting together that was announced last month. I, I, I don't know. We don't know what we're mm -hmm. going to get. And we don't even know if this June date will stick. But I am encouraged that it's an early June date because I know one of the concerns was when Star Trek Beyond came out, they Paramount had said maybe it was released a little too late in the summer to perform well. So at least mm. this one's earlier in the summer. So that might be a good thing for the movie um, if they keep that date. Yeah, for sure. As we know, like film dates are notorious for slipping, right? They, you know, oh, three months here, six months there. Oh, you know, so who knows when this will exactly come out, if it does come out. But that that early June date, like you said, is encouraging for sure. I will say, though, when I saw J.J. Abrams was producing this. I was a little disappointed and don't get me wrong. I like JJ Abrams. I do like the previous three films. I really do. And it's not that I don't want JJ Abrams to produce a film, but I was kind of hoping of just like starting fresh, something new blood in there, new creators, give me something new. And we still may get that, but mm -hmm. I don't know. It was just like the Quentin Tarantino thing got it kind of got me excited because I'm like, ooh, this will be totally different, you know? And now I just feel like, oh, well, I know J.J. Abrams style and stuff, so I kind of know now what we're going to get. And I'm not that I'm not disappointed in that, but I just wanted somebody new in there. Yeah, I definitely get that uh, get that feeling. And yeah, I, in some ways, I definitely agree with you. J.J. Uh, Abrams, he's just producing. There's, there's no, he might not be directing, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, yeah, something new, something moving on would have been some a little bit more welcome, maybe. But uh, I'm I'm still definitely curious as to what this is. 
I don't know, will it be Kelvin timeline or will it be something else? Will it be something that brings the universe back together somehow, as some people have been speculating? I think it's far too early to really speculate on things like that. But uh, it, the, you know, the possibilities really are endless at this point. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering, once we get more information, I'll probably get even more excited. Because if they did say, oh, J.J. Abrams is going to return to directing and the previous cast is all coming back, I think I would get really excited about it at that mm-hmm. point. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, we'll see if the movie happens. And you know what? Any news that we get, we will cover here on the show because we've been covering it, even though we snicker when we're like, oh, here's another movie thing, (laughs) a little (laughs) rumor or announcement or whatever coming out. I want to end today's show on a really light note. I just kind of find it amusing, but also I hope this happens. But there's this whole campaign to get LeVar Burton to be the new host of Jeopardy. (laughs) And I just think that is so cool. I would love to see him host Jeopardy. But we've got all kinds of people going crazy online from Star Trek to Stephen Colbert, just going crazy to try to get LeVar Burton in there. And it's like, should we be joining this bandwagon, Dan? I think so. I'm on board already. I'm on this bandwagon. I would love to see LeVar Burton hosting Jeopardy. I mean, Dick Van Dyke has signed on to this and and said that he wants to see that. That blew my mind. (laughs) (laughs) And we get Dick Van Dyke on Jeopardy too. Why not? (laughs) But yeah, I mean, he hasn't, I mean, they've been going through a rotation of guests hosts, but they haven't had LeVar Burton on yet. So they need to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least give him a chance. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I feel like the show would be a lot longer or they'd get to fewer questions because after every question, you know, they'd give the answer and he'd say, oh, I'm sorry, that's not correct. This is the answer. But don't take my word for it. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, no, all all kidding aside, I, I think he would be a really great fit for that. And I would love to see it for sure. I would too. And his daughter did a great job of the panels. She's been getting involved in Star Trek stuff. So she's a great host too. So yeah, absolutely. let's, let's get LeVar Burton on there. Um, at least give him a guest host spot and see how it goes. You know, let's see how that happens. Anyway, that's, that's, that's everything, Dan. I don't have anything else to cover. Yeah, I think we pretty much covered it all. It was a big week. <laughs> it was a big week. And you know what? I'm not going to say who, but we were possibly going to have a guest on with us. And it just probably would have made the show twice as long <laughs> because there's so much to talk about. You add another voice to it, it would just become longer. So that possible guest may be on the next episode or two. We're working out those details. So I'll leave that a little secret right now. Ooh, I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> yes. So William Shatner is working out with his agent. No, I'm kidding. It's not William Shatner. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dan would have loved that, though. Dan would love to have William Shatner on. Oh, are you kidding? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have him on. It will never happen. Just so you know, because I've done some stuff at uh, the Star Wars Report podcast. Uh, my boss, who has some connections in Hollywood, told me that she was going to get Harrison Ford to come on the podcast. And that was two years ago. And I'm still waiting <laughs> to see. I'm like, I kept telling her, you're never going to get that to happen. She's like, you never know. You never know. I'm like, I'm still waiting. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, well, thanks everyone for joining us. Dan, if people want to talk to you and follow you online, where can they do that? You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. Instagram, Kurtrats47. And of course, the Positively Trek discussion group, my favorite online hangout at the moment. Absolutely. And then I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex and on Instagram at Admiral Rex. And occasionally I'm on the Star Wars Report podcast and uh, been making some guest appearances on Literary Tracks. And then you can follow Positively Track at Positively Track on Instagram and Twitter. And as Dan mentioned, we have our Facebook group. So search for Positively Track and join the group. We also have a Goodreads group about our book club. And you can also email us, PositivelyTrek at gmail.com. And we want to thank our associate producer, William Smith, because he's just a great guy. You know, he's just a great guy. And he learns a lot on how to do podcasting by listening to us. So we're that's that's what Positively Trek 101 is all about. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> yes, Bill Smith at Trek Geeks. So, everyone, thank you for joining us. Have I forgotten anything, Dan? I don't think so. I don't think it's possible to have forgotten anything. We got everything and the kitchen sink in this episode. <laughs> Well, the one thing I did forget, and I'm going to correct that right now, is I want to thank all of you for listening and want to tell you that we hope you stay positive. Stay positive.